What we're seeing here with this illustration is really a beautiful representation of what's going on with the lysosome connecting with the phagosome, which is uh, the part of the uh, cell that actually collects the, the things that need to be recycled. And this is really just a recycling event where this lysosome is connecting and then it breaks down all these things and then we have the opportunity for biogenesis. What's important about this slide is that you see that autophagy is just another way of describing mitophagy. And mitophagy is only different in that the cell organelle that's being recycled is mitochondria. So it's really autophagy and mitophagy are the same thing. We're just talking about uh, the autophagy being that of mitochondria. When Dr. Hine was talking about fission of mitochondria, what we're really doing is this is the process in which we separate the part of the mitochondria that's working well from those part of the mitochondria that need to be recycled. And that's what we see here at the bottom when we have the phagophore that goes through degradation. And then we have biogenesis that creates more mitochondria that are then fused. We see this mitochondrial fusion uh, where we, we, we reform the mitochondria and they're healthy again. So that is kind of the cycle of what we're seeing here and why fission is important and then why fusion is important because we're taking the bad parts of the mitochondria away, we're recycling them and adding them back into those parts of the mitochondria that were healthy. And that creates a very healthy dynamic system. And then the next slide is a little bit more detailed, but it kind of shows you the, the basal mild stress and lethal stress. And, and mild stress is okay, because that mild stress leads to uh, the body saying, hey, look, let's, let's take a look. Uh, we've had some stress. Let's see what's working, what's not working. And we have mitophagy, and that leads to cell survival, because without mitophagy, we're going to get increased mitochondrial reactive oxygen species and then mitochondrial DNA. And if those go high, we have a breakdown, which we'll see toward the middle of the slide, the little red looking mitochondria there, that leads to reactive oxygen species if it breaks down and that leads to cell death. So unhealthy mitochondria that are not able to be recycled burst and they end up contributing to the overall reactive oxygen species within the cell. And that leads to lethal stress. The things we're going to be talking about today, exercise, caloric restrictions, that creates mild stress and leads to mitophagy. But when we get to a stress that we can't recover from, that's more of a lethal stress and we see uh, cell death here. Well, let me give you about three examples and then I will give you even more details uh, on when this should be something we ought to be looking at. So sarcopenia. Uh, this is a loss of decrease in skeletal muscle function and has serious consequences. We have metabolic dysfunction, we have chronic disease susceptibility, we have loss of mobility, and we have increased mor mortality rate with sarcopenia. So it's a serious condition and it's one that we're going to see a lot more as people age. Uh, it's a multifactorial syndrome that occurs with age and results in loss of skeletal muscle mass and function. So this isn't just a mitochondrial dysfunction or a mitophagy issue, but it's a part of the puzzle for sarcopenia. We're starting to find out that it's a really important part of the puzzle. And what's interesting about sarcopenia, which kind of took me aback when I looked at this, was it starts to manifest at approximately 30 years of age. That's really young and it accelerates significantly after the age of 60. And then by the time we're 80 years old, we have lost almost 40% of our muscle mass. And that's pretty, uh, pretty big number, 40% uh, of our muscle mass. So uh, I think we ought to be, when we're looking at people that are aging, that are having sarcopenia, then we really need to be thinking about mitochondrial dysfunction here and the role of mitophagy. So, this is one of my favorites is immune health. Uh, as we, we know, immune health plays a role in almost all disease processes, but we know that metophagy plays a big role here. And accumulating evidence implicates elimination of dysfunctional mitochondria as a powerful means employed by autophagy to keep the immune system in check. I think that's really important to take away, um, that this mitophagy is really important for our immune function. And I don't always think of immune function and mitophagy, but I will now. And so this diagram kind of sums up the role of mitophagy and the immune system. 
And what's interesting is when we get defective mitochondria, you can see that in the middle there, uh, those defective mitochondria that can either go up to mitophagy, and you will see that that leads down a path that settles down the immune system. But if you go the other path and it goes and you start getting like things like mitochondrial reactive oxygen species, mitochondrial DNA, you start seeing things like increased inflammasome. You start seeing things like toll-like receptor 9. You see all of these things that lead to inflammation and autoimmunity. So unhealthy mitochondria are a really important part of this immune uh, function. So neurological health and mitophagy. Um, a large body of work suggests that mitochondrial dysfunction underlies cognitive decline and neuronal aging and one of the most notable hallmarks of age-associated neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, mitochondrial damage causes energy deficit, oxidative stress, and impaired cellular signaling, which has been linked to the pathogenesis of neurodegenerative diseases. So this is kind of important. And as you'll see in this next slide, a lot of things that we say, oh, we're not real sure what's, you know, what's the, the issue here. I know ALS is one that's kind of uh, on the outskirts and people are still trying to put this whole process together. We have Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease. These are pretty um, severe diseases we're talking about here. And they're all connected, as you can see here, with metophagy and mitochondrial dysfunction. So I think it's really important that as we look at these disease processes, we need to understand that it's really a matter of the inability of neuronal cells to really clean house, to clean up the, the debris. And so as we see these neurodegenerative diseases, we see this dysfunction in autophagy and ultimately mitophagy that leads to uh, more degeneration. So really important point to take away here. Uh, one that I didn't realize as much until I got into this literature, uh, what a role uh, mitochondria were playing here. So as we age, we are gonna have more problems with mitophagy. If we have someone with chronic disease, we've got problems with mitophagy. If we have symptoms of inflammation, people with poor diets, increased stress, problems with sleep, we've got to be concerned about problems with mitochondrial dysfunction and mitophagy. So basically I've described most people, 90% or 95% of most people's practices. And I pulled this uh, from an article and it says, it's not surprising to see that loss of function in mitochondria or mitochondrial dysfunction result in numerous conditions throughout the whole body. These conditions cross the time frame from birth to death, including poor growth, developmental delays, learning disabilities, muscle weakness, excess fatigue, exercise intolerance, nervous system dysfunction, and the list goes on. I could read them all, but basically they're describing a classic functional medicine practice and what we see on a regular basis. So when should you think of problems with mitochondrial dysfunction and problems with mitophagy? Always. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. I don't need real testing. If I've got someone that comes in uh, with gastrointestinal disorders, I see a lot of that. I need to be thinking about mitochondrial function. If I'm looking at heart diseases, I need to be thinking about mitochondrial dysfunction and metophagy. So to sum this up, mitochondrial dysfunction is directly or indirectly related to almost all chronic diseases due to the mitochondrial functions of energy production and cell signaling. Okay, this is a really take home slide here, because if you want to know when you should be looking at mitochondrial dysfunction, it's really all the time. Okay, so how do we support mitochondrial health? Well, there's caloric restriction, and I'm not a huge fan of caloric restriction because I can't do it. Uh, quite honestly, you take away 20 to 40% of my calories, and I'm not gonna do well. I, you know, I work out each morning, I've gotta have a certain amount to drive my metabolism, and honestly, I'm just not made to caloric restrict. But there is a lot of data that says caloric restriction is key to mitochondrial health and autophagy and, and likewise mitophagy. So let's not leave caloric restriction and say it's not where we want to go because there are some ways to address that. Now the bad news is as Americans, we are not calorically restricted. If you've been in practice long enough, you know most patients are eating the wrong foods, way too much of the wrong foods, and we really are seeing the opposite of caloric restriction. So 
and, and if you can imagine if, if autophagy and mitophagy and mitochondrial health is related to caloric restriction, excess calories are really going to do the opposite. We know that to be the case uh, when we look at TOR, T-O-R-C-1. Uh, it actually loves you to eat a lot of calories, but it shuts down this process of cleaning up the cell. And so we really want to be careful of and really understand where excess calories are leading us. So what makes caloric restriction successful? Initially, it was thought that the benefits were garnered solely from caloric restrictions. Now, new understandings implicate the following factors manipulation of fasting time. And there's, there's some good news here because we don't have to do that 20 to 40% caloric restriction. The nutrient composition of what we eat, circadian rhythms, age of interventional onset, and the sex, male versus female. So there are some things we can manipulate here uh, to help us get the same effects as caloric restriction without the pain. Because quite honestly, and this data has bore this out, over time, People cannot follow a calorically restricted diet. There's some people that can, uh, and I'm, I'm very proud of them, but as a whole, we tend to have people fall off. So there, there's got, luckily there's, there's some things that we can do as clinicians that will give us the same benefit. And so there is somewhere in between that gives us the benefit without the pain. There's the fasting mimicking diet. I think there's some, a lot of literature on that now. And I think if any of us attended conferences in the last three or four years, we've heard about this. And this is a 900 to 1100 calorie a day over five days. Uh, actually, the nutrients you intake are pretty important. So it's not just reducing calories, but making sure that nutrient ratio is correct. And a lot of the data is showing that this is done once a month uh, for three months, and we get a lot of the same benefits as caloric restriction. Then there's the intermittent fasting diet. This can be between 16 to 48 hours of fasting in between meals. But what we see now more is the 16 hours uh, of fasting and, and the literature is showing that that may have some benefit. Uh, maybe not as much as the fasting mimicking diet, but like I say, the literature is showing benefit from this. Uh, and the exact time, we're not real sure of yet. And then of course, this is one of my favorites because I don't like decreasing my calories. And this is an isocaloric twice a day feeding. Now this was not in humans yet, this was in uh, mice, but this is basically no change in calories consumed in a day. So if you're doing 2000 calories in a day, you would do two periods of complete food restriction between meals that induce autophagy. But these, you would do a thousand calories uh, in the morning, usually between seven and nine, and you would do a thousand calories between five and seven, if that's the calories you're supposed to do. And this has actually been associated with increased muscle mass, which I was super excited about. And I actually have tried it for the last several weeks and I've been very impressed with my results. I haven't lost muscle mass and I've actually been able to control my appetite. So this is summed up really, and uh, I hadn't heard of this one until I started this research. So I really wanted to show this, this isocaloric twice a day feeding, because I think it's something our patients can do. But we can see that we get increased autophagy uh, we get increased fat oxidation. When we look at the liver, we get decreased liver fat. We get decreased glucose. If we move over to the fat, we see more fat oxidation, more browning. We see in the skeletal muscle, increased autophagy, increased muscle mass. We don't actually lose muscle mass with this isocaloric diet. And we, we just see all the right mechanisms being turned on. So this is one I would encourage you to do some more research on to understand, because I think this would be a, a very doable uh, way of in, improving autophagy in our patients. And hopefully it bears out in human studies. So let's talk about the other method of increasing autophagy, ultimately mitophagy, and improving cellular health. And we've seen a lot of studies. I, I mean, you can't open uh, a medical journal without seeing exercise helps with this chronic disease or exercise helps with this chronic disease. And I think autophagy and mitophagy really explain this really well. I think because exercise plays such a pivotal role in these, these functions, I think that's why we can say, this is kind of why this, this studying for this, it's been kind of like an aha moment. I'm like, oh, that's why when we do exercise, we see improvement in all these chronic diseases. So the question became for me is, what type of exercise matters for metophagy? And this is unfortunate because we don't really know yet 
uh, which ones are the best for metophagy and increasing uh, uh, cellular health. We know weightlifting does help. We know that running, uh, especially for over an hour, doing aerobic for over an hour is important. Um, there's some caveats there, but it seems that intensity times duration is really important here from what I can find. And I think the higher intensity where you create cellular stress is really important because ultimately it's cellular stress that's turning on this mechanism to clean up debris and, and to say, hey, we need better functioning of our mitochondria. And so we're gonna have more fission and we're gonna have more um, you know, biogenesis and create more healthy, productive mitochondria and cell organelles overall. So I think what I came away with from the literature is that it doesn't matter necessarily whether you're doing uh, CrossFit or whether you're doing uh, marathons, but the key is to create enough cellular stress that the body is trying to create repair and create a higher functioning cell. So the role of diet in mitophagy, this is kind of kind of connecting the dots here for me. So we, we should know by now that immune function and inflammation is determined by the gut. And inflammation, overall chronic inflammation decreases mitophagy. And poor diet leads to more inflammation. So it kind of shows that, you know, the more, the, the worse we eat, the more inflammation we're gonna have, the, the, the more problems, like the guy eating the pizza, he doesn't have a lot of metophagy going on. But a focused diet on polyphenols has shown benefit in mitophagy. So once again, I think diet, you know, more Mediterranean diet, diet that has a lot of polyphenols, I mean, there is a lot of benefit. There's a lot of reasons why we see these blue zones and what they eat has a lot of polyphenols in them. They have a very clean diet. And that's the one connection we have uh, with mitophagy and longevity. So AMPK insert one, a and these you probably have heard of. I wanted to give you a little science of what's going on here, but AMPK insert one, th th it seems to be the literature's starting to find that there's probably a long-term partnership here with CERT1 uh, uh, independently stimulating AMPK. And AMPK can also be stimulated by other things, um, but it leads to mitophagy. So these cellular mechanisms are really important. So the reason I bring this up is because there's other ways that we can stimulate CERT1 and AMPK. Exercise, caloric restriction plays a big role in AMPK, uh, but there's other things that we can do. There's natural compounds that support mitophagy in model organisms. There's resveratrol that's oriented with AMPK and CERT1. There's berberine, there's quercetin, there's curcumin, and then there's NAD plus precursors, and that works on the CERT1. Okay, so how important is mitophagy? We can see on our left, this is kind of bullying it down, you know, so we have mitochondrial fusion and that leads to mitochondrial fission, which takes the mitochondria that are not being as effective in, in energy production. And we have mitophagy and that mitophagy breaks it down into its component parts. And then we get biogenesis and that biogenesis leads to energy demands being met and we get things like mitochondrial fusion occurring, and we have this whole process that continues. But on the right, we see we have mitochondrial fusion, and then we have the mitochondrial fission, but there's no mitophagy, and there's no biogenesis. And we have these, these mitochondria that are then exposing the cell to mitochondrial DNA, mitochondrial reactive oxygen species, and this leads to cell death. Um, and then, of course, we have a, a dysfunctional system here. So this is ultimately essential for organism health. So when we look at this again, this is a slide we've seen previously. We have mitophagy, and then we have mitochondrial health, which is stable energy, and then cellular health, which is stable entropy, and then we have organism health. I mean, I think after reviewing this, this is really what it all boils down to. Without mitophagy, we have a dysfunctional cell, and then we have overall an organism dysfunction. So with that, I just wanna tell you, I'm really happy that I was here today to talk about this and hopefully put it in a way that we can understand it from a clinical aspect. Thank you.